This is a podcast from Steve Chappelle. Who's Zoomin' Who? Not the 1985 album from the late great Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. This podcast discusses Zoom Video Communications, Inc., a publicly traded provider of video conferencing and web meeting services. Its headquarters are in California, with technical development primarily performed in China. Usage of Zoom exploded through early 2020, and it's easy to understand the appeal. The restrictions placed on the general population during the COVID-19 pandemic necessitated other arrangements for visual communication between individuals and members of organizations. Video conferencing is not new, and there are many comparable services on the market. Skype, for example, was first launched in 2003, and its usage was so ubiquitous that it became a verb, like Google. So why Zoom, now? Well, its features include live conference calls for up to 100 attendees and 40-minute durations, no limit on one-to-one sessions, screen sharing, session recording, and user analytics, for free. Additionally, users don't require login access, so it's very easy for family, friends, and co-workers to engage. Unsurprisingly, this aspect didn't go unnoticed by the bad actors of the web. Like what some Skype users experienced during its popularity surge nearly a decade earlier, reports of strangers joining Zoom sessions and broadcasting offensive content began to appear. This led to a warning from the FBI and their own checklist for minimizing such risks. Another reported weakness has been the potential for unauthorized access to user profile content like photos and email addresses. There is no excuse for these types of weaknesses in technology unless they are so esoteric as to be discoverable only by hackers of the highest expertise. This is usually not the case. Zoom followed these reports with modifications to the platform. However, that this type of problem existed within a relatively new web-based service was beyond disappointing. After requesting your email address, the sign-up process advises, for verification, please confirm your date of birth. Instagram, for comparison, began asking users for birth dates in late 2019 in order to, quote, keep young people safer. Facebook, its parent company, has declared a minimum usage age of 13 since 2006. The minimum age for Zoom usage is 16, so we can assume this is also their official explanation. Are we to also assume that those under 16 can't falsify their birth dates? Or those over 16, for that matter? And they also state that it will not be stored. So what is the substantial purpose of asking for this confidential information? Then there is the elephant in the room, encryption. In simple terms, data encryption ensures that messages, whether text, video, audio, or graphic imagery, are indecipherable to others as they move through the web from sender to recipient. End-to-end encryption limits message accessibility at all points to the sender and recipient only, with none available to service providers, pranksters, stalkers, thieves, or espionage in any form. This is the primary characteristic of a private exchange, or conversation, or meeting. Does recent entrant Zoom protect their users' video meetings with industry standard end-to-end encryption? According to third-party researchers such as the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab, as well as Zoom's own corporate statements, the answer is no. On May 7, 2020, Zoom announced the purchase of secure messaging developer Keybase for the declared intention of providing such end-to-end encryption. The concept of privacy by design was introduced and championed by former Ontario Privacy Commissioner Anne Kavukian in her 2012 book of the same name. Develop technology and its users' protection of privacy simultaneously.
Users should be demanding privacy in all technology, nothing less. If it's not offered in a particular platform or service, drop it and let them know why. Privacy and security concerns about any given technology should be queried and addressed before usage begins, not after the fact, when the damage may be already done. Tests by the Citizen Lab also determined that the video traffic was rooted through the People's Republic of China and therefore subject to the laws of their one-party government. Zoom may very well continue its foray into the public realm, in large part based on its ease of use and low to no cost. Video sessions that include you are subject to the demonstrated privacy and security weaknesses of their service. We will likely consider or continue to take part in web meetings with increasing frequency. If cost and ease of use are your exclusive drivers for choosing a web meeting service, then who's Zoom and who?